Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, family and friends on social media. I want to welcome you today to the ever increasing world feast. Abel Damina is my name. You need to invite a friend, a family member, a loved one. I'm telling you, you need to tag some people, share the video on your page, share with all the groups on your page. It's going to be an exciting adventure in the world of His grace. Always a pleasure and an honor for me to serve you the grace of God right here on this platform with the word of His grace. You know, Brother Paul said, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. That's exactly what we're about to experience today, the teaching of the grace of God. Now listen quickly, please. I want to encourage you to order for my books. The books are on the screen right now. All of them have been written doctrinally to enrich your work with Christ, to give you robust revelation that brings you to a place of accurate, precise knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our vision is to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's what this is all about. Building you, equipping you, so you too are able to do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ is edified. Now listen very carefully. Those of you that are following my teachings right here on social media, if you are in a place where you are not able to attend any local assembly, either because the message of Christ is not well taught or there is no church there that teaches the gospel of Christ the way we do right here in Power City. And you really want a family of believers to belong to. All you need to do today is send me a mail asking for a place to identify with believers in your community. You know, God sets the solitary in families. God wants you to be a member of his family. Two things will happen. Number one, you will bless us with the grace of God on your life. And we will in turn bless you with the grace of God on our lives. It is called mutual faith. You cannot afford not to belong to a local assembly. So that's why it's important for you today to quickly, quickly, if you don't belong to any, reach out to me, send me a mail today, and we'll be glad to respond to your mail. Let me also mention very quickly, for those of you that want to be part of my mentoring academy or our Bible school online, we have an online mentoring academy and Bible school. If you want to join today, all you need to do is send me an email. It's a one-year mentoring class where I mentor you personally and I'm able to meet with you once every week to share with you and fellowship with you, answer your questions and effectively pastor you and watch you grow into the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm truly excited about this opportunity to make a difference in your life. But listen carefully. It's going to be exciting as we study the word of God today. You know, every day we're on social media twice a day. 12 noon, GMT plus one, and 6 p.m., GMT plus one. Tell everybody about this. And I'm looking forward to a wonderful time of studying together with you even now. So fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into the service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. The promises of God. And we're still going to be here for a bit because there's a lot to unpack in this series of teachings. Like us to turn our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 24 verse number 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The word fools. It is a descriptive word in scripture. It means slow of heart. The word heart has to do with understanding. So when he says you are fools and slow of heart, what he implied was that you are slow of understanding. The word fools was used in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 1. Brother Paul said to the church at Galatia, O foolish Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who had bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, 
before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. The word foolishness has to do with the understanding of spiritual things. Or, like he says in verse 3, Are you so foolish of Galatians? The word fools is a Greek word anoitos. A-N-O-E-T-O-S. Anoitos. Anoitos means you are unmindful of something. You are not taking note of something. That's why he calls them fools. So the issue here is understanding. That's why he says they are slow of heart. That is slow in comprehension. Basically about the things of God. Because that's what he is discussing in this context. So you can be a professor but a very foolish person in spiritual things. You can be a professor of mathematics, a professor of chemistry, a professor of, you know, uh, whatever technology. But you can be a very foolish person in spiritual things. Because the word fools is the word anoitos. That is, you are unmindful. So the basic thing is understanding. And he said they are slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Look at that Luke chapter 24 verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So why were they called fools? Because they could not relate the Old Testament to the events of the three days. What was happening to Jesus. They couldn't relate what was said before now to what was happening to Jesus in the event of the three days. They couldn't see God's will. They couldn't see God's plan. They couldn't see God's purpose being fulfilled in their reading of the Old Testament. So he called them fools. Why did he say they were fools again? Look at verse 27 of Luke chapter 24. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. We said that he interpreted the events to them. He was able to make them see the scriptures and the events of the three days. Burial, death, crucifixion, and resurrection. So understanding of the scriptures is to be able to look at the scriptures prophesied. The scriptures symbolized. And then the fulfillment of those prophecies and symbols. And the reality that that understanding of the scriptures brings. So Jesus was able to interpret the events with them by comparing scriptures with scriptures. Jesus did not use extracurricular material to interpret the scriptures. No, he interpreted the scriptures with the scriptures. It's called exegesis. Interpreting the scriptures with scriptures. That's why we say the Bible is a contextual material. It is a book of context. That will mean that the Bible explains itself. It does not depend on external sources for explanation. It has a mind of its own. So it is able to explain itself when you are able to patiently let it explain itself as you read through the text, the pretext, the posttext to understand the context and the content of the scriptures. Jesus used scriptures to interpret itself. So it means that the scriptures has its own understanding. The scriptures has its own understanding. You don't impart or import your own meaning to the scriptures. You don't import your own meaning to the scriptures. Some people try to do that. This is what I think it is saying. This is how I see it. This is the way I look at it, all right? Or this is how I see it all. You hear them say, the Holy Spirit just told me. 
What? The Holy Spirit just told me. They are looking for how to abuse the scriptures. So they use such words. There are two personalities that people lie against very much. And that is the Holy Spirit and Satan. It's either Satan is doing me or the Holy Spirit just told me. And people lie against those two personalities a lot. Now, so there's an interpretation of the scriptures that is already there in the scriptures. The interpretation of the scriptures is already there in the scriptures. Does not depend on external material. It is self-explanatory. All right. Yours is to find out what is the interpretation. Look at Luke chapter 24 verse 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. He mentioned Moses. He mentioned David. He mentioned the prophets. That means the prophecies have those who give them. We can readily relate prophecy and whom did that prophecy come true? The reason why this is like that is you can trace the historical development of revelation in the Bible. You can say things were like this. Men became like this and behaved like this in the Bible. It is easy to trace. That is why Jesus could say beginning at Moses and he knew what Moses wrote. And the Psalms of David and all the prophets. So that there is a historical development of revelation in the scriptures. Notice that in the Bible you will see personalities identified. Then they will say by the spirit. By the spirit. Ezekiel said the Lord spoke to me. So you see personalities then the personalities will say by the spirit. Personalities are mentioned so that you will know the dispensation where they said the things that they said. So in Bible story, when we say Moses, we will be dealing with symbolism. Every time we say Moses, we will be dealing with symbolism. We'll be dealing with types and shadows we will be dealing with the law of sin and death. When we say the prophets, names are identified to be able, you know, to study. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Our fathers has to do with the people that the prophecy came to. Spoken to the fathers. The promise made to the fathers fulfilled unto us their children. The promise made to the fathers. So we have two words there. Sundry times, diverse manners. Polymeros and polythropos. Topography, you know, polytropos. Jesus is also called the word in the beginning john 1 1 was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the word is the word logos jesus is the logos of god the word logos is where we have logic jesus is the logic jesus is the reason behind Jesus is the intent or the thinking pattern of God. We identified that the word logos means reason or basis or understanding. Jesus is the reason. He is the basis 
or the understanding of the scriptures. So that means from the outset, what all the speakers were attempting to do was to give us the understanding of God in Christ. He is how we know God. Jesus is how we know God. Outside Jesus, we are lost where God is concerned. Jesus is how we know God. The highest form of revelation God gave to us was in a man. The highest form of revelation God gave to us was in a man. So a man is the custodian of the totality, the exactness, the precise revelation of God in a man. So God seeks us to know him in a man. That man is Jesus. He is the word of God. In other words, we see God in him. So all the prophets spoke with the understanding of unveiling God in Christ. All the prophets spoke with the understanding of unveiling God in Christ. And that is their emphasis. That is the emphasis of the prophets. So the speakings of the Old Testament is united in Christ. The speakings of the Old Testament is united in the person of Christ. The interesting stuff is that you will not see Christ in the Old Testament. You will not see the word C-H-R-I-S-T in the Old Testament. But Christ is the essence of the Old Testament. Christ is the substance of the Old Testament. Christ is the character of the Old Testament. And Christ gives materiality to the Old Testament. He is the one for whom it was written. He is the idea behind the writing and he is the message written in the Old Testament. Luke 24 verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Mark the word in his name. Luke 24 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. In verse 46, he says, He will suffer, he will rise from the dead the third day. Luke 24 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? And to enter into his glory, he will enter his glory. The word glory is the Greek word doxa, D-O-X-A. Doxa means your office or your authority. So when he said it will be preached in his name, the word name means authority or Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his authority or in his office. In his office. So Jesus Christ died, was buried, and the end point of that, he rose from the dead to an office. He rose from the dead to an office. It is called into his glory. Most of the time we celebrate he is risen from the dead. He is no more in the grave. But the truth of the matter is he is not the first person to be raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Other people were raised from the dead. He is not the first to be raised from the dead. But he is the first person to be resurrected. There are two different things. He is raised from the dead has to do with a status. A status. He wasn't just raised from the dead like Lazarus or Eutychus or Jairus' daughter. Being raised from the dead concerning Jesus has to do with the glory that came after the resurrection or 
that came with the resurrection. There's an office to that resurrection. It is not just that he is raised. He is raised from the dead. Then he's living again on earth. Just like when Lazarus was raised from the dead. He rose from the dead and he lived among the people for some time. Went around, people saw him. No, that's not the same in Jesus' case. In Jesus' case, he was raised to an office. The glory, the doxa, the office, the authority. He was elevated to an office. That's what I want us to look at quickly. You will discover that the word savior was used for Jesus 36 times or was mentioned in the Bible 36 times. The word savior, 36 times. We're going to do some statistics right now. The word savior was mentioned 36 times. The word Lord, L-O-R-D, Lord, was mentioned 3,800 times, in particular, between Matthew and Revelation. So the word Lord comes out 722 times between Matthew and Revelation alone. So there's an emphasis on his lordship, 722 times. The word Christ is used 538 times. And in the four gospel, the word Christ is used 57 times. Then 38 times between Matthew and Luke. And 19 times in the book of John alone. 19 times. Remember, 38 times between Matthew and Luke. But 19 times in the book of John. So, John has a whole lot of explanation to make concerning the word Christ. In the epistles, the word Christ is used 481 times. What does it mean for him to be called Christ? 481 times. In the four gospels, he is referred to as Christ. Why? Because he is anointed. Primarily because he is anointed. He is the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled by Jesus in the book of Luke. That prophecy of Isaiah. So when the Bible says he is Christ in the four gospels, it is referring to Primarily to the fact that he is anointed or he is a fulfillment of Isaiah 61 from verse 1 to 3. Now, we're going to look at the book of Acts chapter 2 and we're going to look at a different prefix in Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 33 to 36. Pay attention. Therefore, glory to God, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he had shed for this which you now see and hear. Something to see and something to hear. Please don't miss those two words. Which you now see and hear. It is called sights and sound. For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, but Lord and Christ. Take note of the word Lord and Christ. Pay attention to that. Now, the word Savior in the four Gospels comes out three times. Savior. Three times in the four Gospels. In the three times, you will find that word in Luke chapter 1 verse 47. Put it up for me. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my savior this was from elizabeth lord and savior 
Luke chapter 2 verse 11. The angels. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. A savior which is Christ the Lord. That was the angel. Then the woman at the well. John chapter 4 verse 42. The woman at the well. And said unto the woman. Now we believe. Not because of thy saying. For we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ. The savior of the world. So three times you find the word savior in the four gospels. Now, I said that the word Christ is used 481 times in the epistles. Let's look at something particular in the epistles. But before we jump into the epistles, Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Let's see how he was identified. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. The word prince means ruler or author. Now let's look at the word savior. Acts 13.23 Of this man's seed had God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ which is our hope. First Timothy Chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. First Timothy, chapter 4, verse 10. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Titus chapter 1 verse 3. But had in due times manifested his word through preaching. Which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. These are verses that talk about the deity of Jesus. God our Savior. Look at Titus chapter 1 verse 4. To Titus... My own son after the common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Titus chapter 2 verse 10. Not Paul mean, but showing all good fidelity. That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. There's an emphasis there on the deity of Jesus. Titus chapter 3 verse 4. But after that, 
the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared. Oh, I love that scripture. Titus chapter 3 verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 1, lots of scriptures, very healthy for you. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All those scriptures unveils the deity of Christ. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. First John chapter 4 verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the savior of the world. Jude verse 25. To the only wise God our savior. To the only wise God our savior. Be glory and majesty. Dominion and power. Both now and ever. Amen. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory. But now and forever, amen. I've given you a plethora of scriptures. If anybody say, how do you prove from the Bible that Jesus is God? All those scriptures I gave you are all the scriptures that establishes Jesus as God. Now, that's all you have in the use of the word Savior. In describing Jesus throughout. So, in writing to the church, the emphasis was not on him being savior. If you notice. That's all the mention of the word savior in all the epistles that we read. But in the letters written to the churches, you find the word Lord. Lord. Which Christ or which was prominently used for Jesus Christ. Lord. The word Lord means master. Or the anointed one. Or the Messiah. Lord. Master. The anointed one. Or the Messiah. Somebody got angry with me some time back. Not too long ago. He said, Dr. Damina, you're just quoting scriptures, quoting scriptures, quoting scriptures, bombarding our head so you can deceive us. <laughs> uh, slow of heart to believe. Fools. Huh. A message, a song, a teaching, a preaching is only inspired to the degree to which it draws its inspiration from the written word. The more scriptures in a message, the more inspired the message. What makes the message is the explanation of the scriptures by the scriptures. That's what makes the message. Now read one verse of scripture and preach for 40 hours. What are you preaching? One verse and you're preaching for three days. What are you preaching? A message, a song, a teaching, a preaching is only inspired to the degree to which it draws its inspiration 
from the written word. That's a seller point. So that shows you that the focus of the epistles is in the covenant position of Christ. You know, there's emphasis in Christ being the Savior, but not enough as being the Lord. Jesus has been the Lord as the focus of him being Christ and him being Lord. So again, let's look at the word died. Died. Like Christ died. Christ died is used 112 times in the New Testament. I told you we are going to do some statistics. In the book of Romans, it is used 23 times. And it speaks of Christ. The other majority speaks about man. Died. Let's look at the epistles. The emphasis in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The word Christ died is used three times. Died. And five times Christ. Died three times. Five times Christ. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But between Galatians to 2 Thessalonians, the word died is used seven times. And just three times about Christ. In the book of Hebrews, died is used seven times. None for Christ. Same as Jude. None for Christ. In other words, the focus of explaining Christ's redemption was a whole lot in his resurrection. The resurrection was used to explain his death. So, the focus of the teaching was much more on his resurrection. Much more. Let me explain again. He is called Savior, but not as much as he is called Lord and Christ. So, the emphasis is in him being Lord and Christ. The office he attained when he rose from the dead. So there's a whole lot to see in his resurrection. The resurrection explains his death. So we teach his death from his resurrection. We teach his death from his resurrection. So, the current office of Jesus has much more emphasis in scripture. His current position. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. He didn't say, if Christ did not die. Mm -mm. If Christ is not risen. Is not risen. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ be not raised. Your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. So the good news of the gospel is not his death. The good news of the gospel is his resurrection. Because that is where he said, if he is risen from the dead, you are not in sin. But if he is not risen from the dead, you are yet in your sins. That's a very key scripture. So the focus, therefore, of our teaching will be in his resurrection. Glory to God. The focus of our teaching will be in his resurrection. Glory to God. He has risen from the dead, he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, he is Lord, he is Lord, 
He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The focus of our teaching will be in his resurrection. I want you to look at the word together with me. Life. L-I-F-E. Life. The word life is used 135 times in the Bible. 135 times. But the book of John alone has the word life 37 times. 37 times. The three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, has the word life 16 times. John alone, 37 times of the 53 times of the gospels. The book of Acts, has the word life eight times. Eight. So, John has a whole lot to say about the resurrection than any other person. Has a lot more to say about the resurrection than every other person. Because John focuses on life. John's later... In John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. In him was life and the life was the light of man life john taught a whole lot about life that was his emphasis the other three gospels matthew mark and luke has life only 16 times all of them put together now the book of acts has life eight times. The entire book of Acts. Romans 15 times. First and second Corinthians eight times. Galatians once. Ephesians once. Philippians three times. Colossians two times. First Timothy six times. Titus two times. Hebrews Two times. All right. James twice. First and second Peter three times. First John 13 times. Jude once. Revelation, which is written by John nine times. So just John alone in the epistles 22 times. So John didn't use Christ like Paul. And Paul didn't use life like John. Did you get that? John didn't use Christ like Paul. And Paul didn't use life like John. But what life was to John was what Christ was to Paul. Now, so when Paul focuses on Christ risen from the dead, John focuses on life. John talks about his resurrection. John uses life more in explaining. Paul uses Christ more in explaining. Christ the Lord. Paul. You will discover for instance, the way Paul writes, you won't see life or eternal life much in his epistles. Like you will find John using life, eternal life, life in his writings. Brother John used the word life in his teaching. 
Brother Paul used the word Christ and the word Lord. So, did God promise life from the beginning of the world did God give us a promise of life? All right. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. When did he give us a promise of life? Huh? In the beginning? In the beginning? Huh? Okay, let me take you in the beginning. So again, the resurrection of Jesus explains his death. And it's in the resurrection of Jesus that we explain the death. Why? Because the focus of the epistles is in his resurrection. His life. 2 Corinthians 1.19 for the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Next verse. For all the promises. What is the word all from what I taught you? What is the word all? Great. For the great promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. The word promise is the Greek word epangelion. Epangelion. Which means the promise firstly has to be spoken. Then it is a pledge. That the maker of the statement must fulfill. That the maker of the statement fulfills. An oath you make to do something. But that oath is firstly an utterance. So all the promises of God are in Christ fulfilled. In other words... All the promises of God were spoken concerning Christ. They were spoken concerning Christ. All of God's promises. Romans chapter 15 verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The promises were spoken to who? The fathers. Very important. The fathers. Which of the fathers? The fathers. The patriarchs. All right. Which of them? Of the Jews. The fathers of the Jews. Fathers in the Bible refers to which books? Huh? Genesis to Malachi. Great. Fathers. Genesis to Malachi. That was how the fathers were spoken to the oracles of God. Remember the oracles of God? Romans chapter 9 verse 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertained the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Give me verse 5. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So the oracles were given to the fathers. How were they said 
to the fathers. Acts 3.21 Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What do we mean by the mouth of the prophets? The words. The words of the prophets. So that means whatever God did in Christ, he must have said it before. Nothing just happened with Christ. It was all spoken by the mouth of the prophets to the fathers as a promise that Christ fulfilled. So, we are studying life. Where did God promise life? Titus chapter 1 verse number 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, underline that, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. The word cannot lie is not like I say, what is your name? And your name is Josephine. And then you look at me and say, Christiana. That's not the lie we're talking about here. When he said, God that cannot lie, it means whatever he says has integrity in it to come to pass. That's the meaning of he cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18 That by two immutable things in which it was impossible. Hallelujah. Impossible for God to lie impossible. Even if he wants to, he cannot. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. When he began to emphasize the integrity of God, what was he talking about? Life. God that cannot lie promised. He promised life from the foundation of the world. So life is not an afterthought. Life was the plan. Life was God's intent. Life was God's agenda. Life was God's program. Life was God's purpose. From the foundation of the world. And God that cannot lie. Meaning whatever it takes. Life must be fulfilled. By two immutable things. It's impossible for God to lie. Hallelujah. We lay hold onto those words as a consolation. Because we have fled. For refuge. We are in him. Who is life. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you. Are you blessed? Glory to God. Father I pray for everybody. Under the sound of my voice. Online in our campuses. On radio. On television. and social media. This life continues to find expression. In every believer. And I decree and declare that this revelation grows big on our inside until nothing else matters. And I decree that every hold of the enemy, every hold of the enemy is broken in the name of Jesus. For God has not given to you the spirit of fear. So you fear, go in the name of Jesus. I cast down imagination by the word of faith. We bring every thought under subjection. Fear, Go in the name of Jesus. 
You have not received the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of a sound mind. Metola, Rakota, every voice of the enemy using fear to cripple you, that voice is silenced in the name of Jesus. Metola, Negoza, Karato, Mekere, Nekele, fear, go in the name of Jesus. You are secured, you are far from oppression. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. The rod of the wicked shall not rest on the lot of the righteous. You are far from oppression in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, glory to God. The life of God reigns on your inside. The life of God reigns in your body. The life of God reigns in your family. You enjoy the abundance of God's life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Great grace is upon you today in Jesus' precious name. And every believer shouts that amen on a note of finality. Glory! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I know you've been blessed, affected, impacted by the word of God. And I believe, God, that the revelation of Jesus will grow big on your inside until nothing else matters. In Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said in the beginning of the broadcast, if you live in the area around anywhere in the continents of this world where you follow my teachings, but there's no Christ-centered teaching church in your community, and you either want to start one or you want to identify with our own campus, we call our branches campuses all over the world. Today, all you need to do is to send me a mail and we will connect you with brethren in your area who follow my teachings so together you can grow with them evangelize, raise disciples, and build the kingdom of God. If that's what you want to do, or you want to start a campus in your community, you don't know of any, you want to start one. Yeah, we're committed to training you, equipping you, and enriching you so that you're able to effectively start a campus, pioneer a work in your community, and bring other believers together to be fed and nourished in the knowledge of Christ. If that's what you want, also send me a mail today. The email address is dramina at yahoo.com. Hey guys, we love you. You know, God doesn't want you to be isolated. So if you don't belong to a place of worship, maybe because of what is taught there or you're not growing in that church and you want to really grow, then I invite you today to adventure with us and identify with us, give us the opportunity to serve you, to feed you, to equip you so that the purpose of God for your life will find fruition in the name of Jesus. We love you guys. Always a joy to share with you the grace of God. I'm looking forward to connecting with you in the next broadcast. And until then, enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Amen. Amen to your victory.